If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask if you would to turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, I'm going to be reading verses 3 through 7. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 3 through 7. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with a valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was hung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. I want you to strap on your seat belts for a moment and board a time machine and go back with me many, many years when battles were, fight, were fought man to man, eye to eye, toe to toe, when the only thing that stood between you and death was a sword a spear, and a shield. Now I want you to picture two hillsides that slope down into a valley. On one hillside camped the army of the Philistines. Now these people in the Bible were always pictured as those who opposed God's purpose and who opposed God's people. On the other hill encamped the Israelite army. Now these were the people of God set apart by God for God's purpose and to accomplish God's purposes in the world. Now each morning when the sun would rise, so would the two armies. And they would dress in their full armor. They would sharpen their swords and spears. They would shine their shields. And then they would begin to chant. And this chant would become louder and louder until it become a taunting war cry. And there was a great tension on both hills because at any moment these two armies could rush down the hill and clash into a bloody, deadly battle in the valley. Now there was a man named Jesse who had three sons who had followed King Saul, the Israelite king, into battle. And so Jesse had not heard from his sons in many days. And so he called his youngest son David, who was a shepherd boy to him, and he said, I want you to go to the Israelite camp, and I want you to find out how your brothers are doing. Now take this roasted grain and bread to your brothers, and take this cheese to your commanders, to the commanders of the army. So David, that obedient son of Jesse, he rises early the next morning. He gets someone to take care of the sheep and put someone in charge of that uh, and those other chores that he may have. And he heads off toward the battlefield. He arrives just as the sun is coming up, I can imagine. And David, this young, impressionable boy, between the ages of 12 and 16, he's so impressed at what he saw. Because as he looks up at the Israelite army on that hillside, he sees them as they're beginning the war cry. And he sees as the sun reflects off the armor and the shields and the swords. And it looks like the whole hillside is on fire. And I'm sure David says, my God, the warriors of God, the mighty army of God. He had arrived there and the war cry begins to reverberate through the valley. The shouts and the screams. And David is so excited. He begins to move toward the Israelite ranks. Then suddenly, as David is moving toward the Israelite army, the hill grows silent. One by one, it becomes very silent and still. And then David notices that the Israelite army is looking down toward the valley. And so he turns and he looks. And out from the Philistine army steps a man walking down that hillside. He's not just an ordinary man. He's a giant of a man. The Bible says that he's six cubits at a span. That would be in today, nine feet, nine inches tall. 
he has a shield bearer walking before him. And he looks like a tank that could crush anything in his path. He's not just a skinny little old basketball player here. He's a huge giant of a man decked out in full battle gear. And Goliath, he finally reaches the valley. And he stops and he pauses and he looks up at the Israelite army. And he says something like this. Hey, you sissies up there. Anybody want to fight? You are slaves of Saul. You have no God. I defy your God. You brag about your God. You come into this land bragging about how your God delivered you from the mighty army of the Egyptians. How Moses led you across a dry red sea and brought you here. You, you brag about a God that just with a shout called the walls of Jericho to fall. I defy your God. You're a bunch of cowards and slaves. Why do we have to continue in this bloodshed? Let's stop it today let's just one man fight against me you send me your best warrior and we will fight mano a mano no more bloodshed than necessary just send me your best warrior if your man defeats me all of the philistines will become your slaves but if i defeat him all of you will become my slaves and the bible says that the israelite army trembled in fear now David drops the cheeses and the breads and he begins to bound toward the army. He, of course, like any young boy would do, he's going to look for his bigger brother. After all, his big brother, he's always the courageous one, right? So he looks for Eliab, who's the oldest brother. So he finally finds Eliab among the army and he, and he, begins, he says to him, he says, Hey, Eliab, you can take this giant. Just go get him. And Eliab's like, whoa, 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 what are you doing, boy? Shut up, shut up, shh. What are you doing here? You're not even supposed to be here. I know why you're here. You're here just to watch the battle. I know why you've come. Why aren't you home feeding the sheep and taking care of the sheep? Who's doing that? You just need to get on back home. Now, in the meantime, David says, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason, Eliab? Is there not a reason? Is there not a cause? I mean, after all, there's a reason and a time to stand, and this is it. There's a reason to fight. After all, this man's taunting the army of God. This man is taunting God. This man is defying our God. He's saying we have no God. It's time to take a stand. Won't anybody take him on? Now, word gets back to King Saul. And King Saul's in his tent, and he's pacing back and forth, and he's thinking, this is not going to look good on CNN. This is not going to look good on Fox News when they see what's going on down here. And it, this is a political disaster. Not only is his army trembling in fear, but a, suddenly a commander walks in. He says, there's a young boy out here, just a young boy. And he's, he's stirring up the troops. He's humiliating the troops. And, David says, and then Saul says, oh, my goodness, bring that boy to me. Let me shut him up before he gets back to the hometown. And so David is brought in to King Saul. As soon as David enters the tent, as soon as he enters the door, he says to King Saul, I'm your servant. I'm your servant, King Saul. I will go slay this giant for you. Now Saul looks at this little boy. He's got mighty warriors decked out in full battle gear. And here's this 12, 13, 14-year-old kid Willing to go and fight this champion of champions. Saul says, son, I appreciate your bravery. I really do. But you're way too young. You're way too young to go fight this man. You got to understand who this man is. This man who's in that valley, this man's name is Goliath. He's the champion of champions. He's un the undisputed, undefeated champion of the world. And so David, he tells Saul a story. He says, it's true, I am a boy, and I'm a shepherd boy. But you know what, Saul, there's times when I'm out there and I'm watching over the sheep, and a bear 
one day came out of the woods and he grabbed one of my sheep and he began to drag one of my sheep off and he, I went over and I grabbed that bear by its hair and, and, and I slew that bear. Another time a lion came out and he came over and it creeped up and it pounced on one of my little lambs and I thought it was going to tear that little lamb apart and I went over and I jumped on the back of that lion and I grabbed its hair, its mane and I slew that lion and the God that delivered me from the paws of the bear and from the jaws of the lion will certainly deliver me from the hands of this heathen Philistine who defies our God. Now Saul begins to think for a moment. I mean, this is a bad political situation. The morale of the troops is at an all-time low. Could he actually consider sending this boy out to fight this giant? I mean, what if he did? What would happen? I mean, maybe if, if he sent this boy out, then the army, the Israelite armies would see this boy so full of courage, this boy going to do a man's job, maybe one of them would step up, do their job, be the man that they're supposed to be. Or maybe Goliath would see this boy and go, I'm, I'm not fighting a kid. Or maybe if the giant did kill him, then we could always have the battle cry, remember the boy, remember the boy. For whatever reason, Saul thought, well, this is really the only option I have. And so Saul said, okay, son, go. Go ahead and God be with you. But before you go, I want to give you my armor. Now, if you've read the Old Testament, you know that Saul was a big man himself. As a matter of fact, he was a head taller than all the other Israelites. And so Saul, he takes off his kingly armor and he puts the breastplate on David. And when he puts the breastplate on him, David, this small boy, the breastplate falls uh, over his knees and soon it drops off his shoulders and falls onto the sand. So then uh, Saul gives David his shield and, and David's holding that shield and, and he can't even move with it because it's dragging on the ground. Saul gives uh, David his sword, and the sword is once again is on the ground, and he, and he can't even unsheathe it, and, and he's like looking at Saul, and Saul finally places the helmet uh, uh, on David, and when he does, it just falls over his eyes, and David says, I look ridiculous. I'm not, I can't fight like this. And so David takes off the armor, and then he goes out to meet this giant. Now David does have a weapon, uh, several First of all, he has a stick. He's got a stick, and he's got a pouch, and he's got a sling. Now, I had slingshots back when I was growing up, and a kid can cause a lot of damage with a slingshot. I had a slingshot, and you know, most of us, when we think of those slingshots, we think of a, you know, a piece of wood made into a Y, and it's got uh, two pieces of rubber between it and a little pouch in the back, and you pull back, you put a rock in there, and you pull back on the slingshot, and then the elasticity of that rubber, once you let it go, will shoot that rock forward. But unfortunately, back in this day, there were no old inner tubes laying around. And so David had to improvise. His slingshot was simply two pieces of leather, two strands of leather and a pouch. And what would happen is you would put the stone in the pouch and you would begin to whirl this slingshot around and then you would release one of the strands and that rock would shoot forward. So David, he heads toward the valley. As he's heading toward the valley, he crosses a brook. And the Bible says that he reaches down and he picks up five smooth stones. Now, I don't know why he picked up five. Maybe he thought maybe some more giants was going to come after him. But he picked up five smooth stones and he puts them in his pouch and he continues down that hill. Now, Goliath has been pacing in that valley. He had been there for 40 days. 40 days he had walked down that mountain, that hill. 40 days he had looked up at that Israelite army. 40 days he had screamed and taunted and cussed for a man to come and meet him and to end this battle. And he's just about to turn around on the 40th day to head back up that hill, back toward the Philistine army, when out of the corner of his eye, he notices there's movement from the Israelite ranks. So he turns around and he sees finally someone coming to meet him. Someone from the Israelite army is walking down that hill. He's excited. 
He's adrenaline's pumping. He's ready to end this battle. And then all of a sudden, he notices as this warrior gets closer to him that he's not wearing any armor. Not only that, but he also notices he, he doesn't have a beard. Not only that, he notices that he's just a boy. And then he notices the boy has a stick. Now, I'm going to tell you, a boy with a stick can be dangerous. But Goliath had no fear. And Goliath, he looks at this boy walking down this mountain, down this hillside with a stick. And he looks back at the, at the Philistine army and they're rolling in laughter. And so David, I mean, Goliath looks at David and he finally he says, what am I? What am I? Am I a dog that you're going to come chase away with a stick? Come to me, boy. Come here. Because today I'm going to pop your head off like a pimple. Today I'm going to pull your little arms off that spindly little body. And I'm going to pluck off your legs. And I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now David... David, he's there, you know, David, he, he, he doesn't run. He doesn't budge. I mean, he's armed with a stick, a sling, and faith that his God is bigger than the giant he's facing. Then David says, looks up at Goliath, and he says, I tell you what I'm going to do to you, you overgrown ox. I'm gonna, I'm, today, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field because you come to me with your armor and your spear and your sword and your shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God who you have defied. And God is able to deliver you into my hands this day. Now, this makes Goliath mad. I mean, he's, he's infuriated. I mean, he's killed men for snoring too loud. And here's this little smart alecky kid talking back to him. No one talks back to him. And so Goliath begins to move toward David. David, he reaches into his pouch. He pulls out one of those stones. He puts that stone in his sling, and he begins to whirl that stone round and around and around again. And finally, he releases one of those strands, and that rock shoots forward. And somehow, miraculously, that rock hits Goliath right between the eyes, right where the helmet doesn't protect his forehead, and it buries itself right there. Now, the Philistine army, they're in shock. The champion, as he drops to his knees, the champion is down. He's not defeated, but he's down. The Israelite army looking on. They can't believe what they're seeing. Suddenly, David, he runs up. He grabs Goliath's own sword, and he rips it from the sheath, and he waves it in the morning sun. Then he brings it down over the head, over the neck of Goliath. And then David reaches down, and he grabs that big old bloody head of Goliath, and he begins to lift it up, and he lifts it up toward the Philistine army. Army. And the Philistine army, they begin to flee. They begin to run. And the Israelite army, now seeing that God has brought about, about a miracle, they begin to rush down that hill in pursuit. And that day, a mighty war, a mighty battle is won for God. Mm. Now, in this story, in this simple story, there are three categories of people. And today, those three categories of people sit among us today, right now. And I want, as you listen to the rest of this message, I want you to categorize yourself. I'm not going to categorize you. Only you know your heart. First of all, I need to ask you, are you a Philistine? Are you a Philistine? You see, these are people that play games with God. They mock God's people. They rely on their popularity or power or prosperity or politics to give their life meaning. You don't need all that religious stuff. Religious stuff is for old folks and sissies who cannot handle life. You know, religion is just a crutch to them. But one day, the Philistine is going to see that whatever they lean on is going to fail and it's going to fall because everyone in this room, even those outside this room, everyone in this world is one day going to need God. You see, it does, I don't have to say very much to a Philistine. 
Because eventually, you're going to need God. I remember a story of a man. He loved his wife deeply. And his wife one day went to a church service and gave her heart and her life to Christ. And she became a Christian. And so she loved the Lord. She got into the Word. She got into prayer. And her life began to slowly change. Now, her husband, he loved her deeply. And, but, you know, religion just wasn't for him. He just wasn't into all that church stuff. After all, it was fine for her, but not for him. She would ask him to go to church with her. She would say, will you go with me? And he wouldn't go. She would say, won't you just please, just, just come check it out. Just, just go with me. She would, he would see her praying, but she wouldn't pray. I mean, she, he would see her praying, but he wouldn't pray. And, and he wouldn't read the Bible. And he wouldn't go to church. It just, just wasn't for him, you know. Well, one day his wife found out that she had a fast-spreading cancer. And it looked like that this cancer would take her life. As she lay in the hospital bed in her final hours, she looked up at this husband that adored her. He had spent his trying to please her, to give her every physical thing a man could give his, his wife. Any needs that she had, he tried, to make, he tried to give. She looked up at him and she said, Honey, will you pray for me? And he said, Baby, I'll do anything for you. She said, then, then just pray for me. He said, is there something else I can do? She said, I just need you to pray right now. He said, baby, I don't know how to pray. She said, in my whole life, everything I wanted, you gave to me. But the thing I most need, you can't give me. You see, one day you're going to need God. The Bible tells us that there's going to come a day when every person is going to stand before the judgment seat of God. And the Bible tells us that on that day, every knee will bow. Every one. From Donald Trump to Joe Biden to you. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When you see him face to face, you'll have no choice. When you meet the creator of the universe, you will bow. You will bow. In fear, humility, you see, the question is not, will you bow? The question is, will you bow while you have a choice to bow? Because one day that choice is going to be taken away. Right now, you have a choice. Philistine, there's going to come a day that you need God. Second category of people that were in this story are Israelites. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 20, it says, Early in the morning, David left the uh, flock in the care of the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out into its battle positions, shouting the war cry. You see, this is God's army, right? The righteous, the believers. You see, they love to shout in a crowd. They love to hear that good old gospel music. They the rhinestone cow Christians with a Sunday religion riding into church on Sunday and trembling at the world on Monday. They stand on the mountaintop and they scream and shout and praise, but they're unwilling to face the giants in the valley. Oh, they like to talk about the past. How God delivered them from drugs and alcohol, much like the Israelites of old. How God delivered them from Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, survived the desert. How he showed up and showed out as he gave them victory after victory in the promised land. But right now when there's a giant in the valley, you're trembling in your boots. Today, Israelite, you love to study the Bible. You love to talk about how great God is and heroes of the word. What God has done in your past, your theological uh, theologically sound you believe all the right things but you don't do the right things and your faith slips away when giants step into your path I watched a movie back when I was in college which was a long time ago but this movie was called Super Christian and I remember this guy you know it, it, the movie starts off with this guy man he's playing basketball and he's out there running over people, knocking them down. He's, he's cussing a referee and screaming at the referee. 
He gets into his car. He's driving home. He's flipping the bird to those who are trying to pass him. You know, he, he's, he, he comes home and he, he throws his stuff down and screaming at his friends and his wife. But on Sunday morning, all of a sudden that alarm goes off and he rises up out of bed. He pulls those pajama tops off and there it says super Christian. All week long, he's lived like the devil. But on Sunday morning, he's super Christian. Hmm. Israelites, it's time you quit be just believing and start doing. It's time that you fight in the valley instead of just shouting on a mountaintop. It's time that we live a Christian life. Because the fact is, living a true Christian life is tough. But either you will fight or you will fail. And Jesus doesn't ask for your perfection, but he does always ask your predictability that you will always be found fighting. So I ask you today, are you a Philistine or are you an Israelite? And the last category of people in this story are Davids. You see, Davids, they are the few, aren't they? They're the fighters the lake walkers, the lion tamers. They're those that rather burn than bow. They're lights of the world. They're the salt of the earth. They take Christianity out of the building and they make it work in the real world. They're real people. They're solid. They're committed. They're the same in school and at work as they are in church, in the church building. They're the same. They're consistent. They're persistent. They stand against the crowd. They're the ones we crawl to when life gets too tough. I've had people who ridicule me, but look for me when life crumbled around them, and I also need help. But when I do, I don't look to Israelites. I look to David's because the Israelites are too busy shouting instead of serving. Now, to David's, your God is almighty. Your God is your champion. And he is the God of the underdog. He loves the underdog. Your God is the God who is the lover of great comebacks. He likes it to be at the last second, you know, when all of a sudden he makes something happen. Your God is a lover of raising things from the dead. He likes it when no everybody else counts them out. When Jesus was in the tomb for three days and everybody counted him out, God spoke and Jesus came out. And let me say this, the same power that resurrected Christ is available in your life today to overcome sin and to walk in victory in Jesus. How badly today we need Davids. Mm. There was a little girl in a school in uh, Memphis several years ago. It was a private school. It was a Christian school. But even though it was a Christian school, there's not a lot of Christians there. Sort of like church sometimes. You got a lot of church folks, but not a lot of Christians there. But this little girl, she did something very plain and simple. Every day before she ate her meal in front of that cafeteria, she would bow her head and she would close her eyes and she would say a grace over her meal. Now, there were several people who made fun of this frail little girl. She wasn't the most attractive girl at the school. She was skinny. She was frail. She wore glasses. They liked to get up behind her when she would pray. Some of them would make little funny faces and make little snide remarks, you know. They would mock her as she prayed. One day, this boy had this great idea. It was, it was going to, it was going to be so funny. He, they, they used to have these squirt bottles of uh, mustard on the tables. So he took that squirt bottle and as soon as she bowed her head and closed her eyes, he took that squirt bottle right over her head and he squeezed it and all that mustard came out and it ran through her hair and it ran over her face and the whole cafeteria erupted in laughter. And then the little girl, she stood up with that mustard running down her face and she pushed back her chair and everybody got silent when she said, Yes, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I wish you could all know Jesus. I wish you could all know how much Jesus loves you. Now, the youth pastor of this young little girl, he heard this story. 
And this school actually had a chapel services. They'd have chapel once a week. And this youth pastor was asked to come and speak at that chapel. And he went and he spoke and he preached a sermon. And the sermon he called it, Sissies Who Put Mustard in Little Girl's Hair. After he preached that message, this young boy come bounding down those bleachers. He grabbed that youth pastor's hand. And he said, I'm the man. I'm the one. And he said, I want what she's got. I want what she's got. Revival started in that school because one little girl stood up when everybody else would have sat down. One little girl chose to stand and made a stance. And many people are in eternity because one little girl who was saved by her testimony and by her actions, many others came to know Christ. You see, we must realize to be truly Christian, to be a David, is not found in shouting only in church. It's not simply about debating the Bible or how many praise songs you know. It's not about listening to K-Love or saying prayers at night until you fall asleep. You see, to be truly Christian, to be a David, is made up of small everyday choices to trust and to follow Christ. David was following God whether or not he had to meet that Goliath in the valley or not. That just happened to be the circumstance that was set before him. And when it was set before him, he met it because David was being obedient every day in the small and simple things such as slaying lions and bears. You know? Even when we are facing impossible odds, and the rest of the so-called believers are trembling or nowhere else to be found. David's stand. And they stand for God even if that means they have to stand alone. Are you a David? God's calling out Davids today. He needs Davids today. He needs real people. Real warriors for God. Real men and women who are ready to wage war on hell. Jesus says about his church, he says his church will be those who believe in him and trust in him. And when the church is unified and it begins to march, the gates of hell will rise up against it, but the gates of hell will not prevail against the onslaught of the mighty church. And the gates of hell is not an offensive weapon, it's a defensive weapon. Let me say this, if you're a David, Satan's more afraid of you than you should be of him. Because once you stand and know who you are in Christ and wage war in the name of Jesus to make, bring about the kingdom of God in this world, once you recognize whose and who you are, you will stand up and Satan will tremble. Mm. If you're a Philistine today, not much more I can say to you except that, like I said, one day you're going to need God. And one day you're going to recognize and realize that everything these sorry old backwoods uneducated folks said to you was exactly right. And one day you're going to bow. Whether you think you will or not, doesn't really matter. You can believe the world's flat or you can believe the world's round or you can believe whatever you want to believe, right? But the fact is God's real. God's real. If you're an Israelite, it's time for you to repent. It's time for you to quit trembling on hillsides. It's time for you to see that giant in the valley and realize that God placed that giant there for his glory. That whatever it is that you're facing today, God planted that there for his glory. You just got to go fight the giant. It's time to take it to him. But I'm asking today, do you want to be a David? And it begins this morning with a decision, a simple decision to trust and obey that you've decided to follow Jesus, that you're going to give yourself, your heart, and your life to him. I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me as we close this service this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I wonder how many of you would say this morning, Brother Wade, I am a Philistine. I have never given my heart, my life to Jesus, but today I want to do that. I'm tired 
of living the way I'm living. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I feel lonely. I feel depressed. I feel uh, that life is, that there's got to be something more to this life than what I'm experiencing. And today, I'm ready to give my heart and my life to Jesus. Brother Philip and myself will be up here. We're just going to pray with you. Just step out from where you are. You can step out right now and begin to come. Some of you this morning are Israelites. Man, you are a Christian, I guess, but you're cold, you're dead. Probably if you didn't call yourself a Christian, nobody else would. There's not any really real victory in your life. You're doing the same things the world's doing. You're living the same way the world's living. There's absolutely no difference between you now than your buddy who works beside you in the factory or the person that sits beside you in the next, next desk at the school. All you love to shout and sing praise uh, songs. But you're too afraid to stand up for what's right. It's time for you to repent. It's time for you to become a David. Some of you this morning, you're ready to become a David. And God's calling you. God's calling you. He's reaching out to you right now. We need some young folks to become Davids in that youth group up there. We need some old folks to become Davids in the workplace and in the schools and wherever they may be. We need you today to choose to stand for right. We're going to begin this invitation. We're going to pray. The invitation is going to begin. God, we just thank you this morning that you called us here and brought us here for this day, for this message. And Father, I pray this morning that God, you would anoint this invitation time. Bring us to you, God. Raise up David this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.